I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guest on today's first meeting is Mike Mose, the general partner at VMG Partners, which is one of those little-known closed-capacity private equity firms that a small number of top institutions have loyally invested with since its founding 15 years ago. VMG manages $2 billion, focused solely on building iconic consumer brands, and has an astonishing record of delivering a 45% IRR to its LPs since inception. Our conversation covers Mike's path from banking to private equity investing, VMG's thesis in the CPG space, its investment criteria, sourcing, work with portfolio companies, assessment of brands, and exit strategy. We then discussed the firm's decision-making process, how it built a business with a core group of LPs, and the globalization of brands and work in China. Today's episode is sponsored by Venn by Two Sigma. I'm sure that like me, you're accustomed to efficient technology in your daily life, from ride-hailing apps to personal budgeting tools. So why do allocators still lack the technology to make data-driven decisions easily? Two Sigma, a financial services company with over $60 billion in assets under management, saw an opportunity to leverage the expertise in technology and investment analysis the firm has developed to help investors answer the critical questions they face every day. The result? Venn by Two Sigma, a cloud-based investment analytics platform designed to help allocators efficiently make data-driven investment decisions. Venn can help investment teams improve manager evaluation, optimize portfolio allocations, and manage total portfolio risk by leveraging the Two Sigma factor lens. You can start using Venn for free by going to venn.twosigma.com slash CA. That's V-E-N-N dot twosigma.com slash CA. Today's show is sponsored by Adam Finance, an investment research platform built by a former hedge fund allocator who sought to upgrade expensive institutional tools. Adam's functionality includes instant financial modeling, powerful news and document search, discussion groups, and brokerage integration, all of which are available in a cloud-based system on your computer and any mobile device. Try Adam Finance for free today at adam.finance, that's A-T-O-M dot finance, or download the Adam Finance app on the iOS and Android platforms. Please enjoy my first meeting with Mike Mose of VMG Partners. Mike, good to see you. Thank you for having me. Why don't we just dive in on your background? Sure. Sure. So I grew up in St. Louis and Summit, New Jersey, and I was a soccer player. I was going to head down to Davidson College to play soccer down there, and I needed a summer job. Some of my father's friends said I should get a job on Wall Street because they don't work very long hours and they make good money. And as an 18-year-old, I thought that would be a great job. So I wrote a bunch of letters to all these Wall Street firms and got turned down by everyone with the exception of one. Payne Weber sent me an acceptance letter without even interviewing me. So I showed up my first day. They didn't know what to do with a summer one. I think it was probably a mistake that they sent me an acceptance letter. And they ended up working four summers for Payne Weber on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, the New York Commodities Exchange, and the back offices, and really learned a lot about the guts of Wall Street. And was that trading-oriented? So that was trading-oriented. And and I was told I did a good job because I had long, skinny arms and I could get the tickets into the pits of the commodities exchange. So it was kind of pre-technology and having these long, skinny arms, I think, was a real help back then. And as I was doing more on Wall Street, I heard about this program of these financial analysts working in the corporate finance area. And at the time, there weren't a lot of those on Wall Street. And they were this really wonderful kind of glamorous job. And I wanted to do that. I was getting turned down by everyone as I was writing letters to try to interview, with the exception of Payne Weber again. And they invited me to come in for an interview, and I interviewed there. And that went well. And during that day of interviews, 
they said I should also consider another program that they were opening up. And that was called the Corporate Intern Program, which sounded like a terrible name, but it was an interesting program where they hired 10 kids out of college and we rotated around the firm for two years to really understand the business and really learn all the different areas. I had the chance to work in corporate finance. I had the chance to work in municipal finance, on sales and trading. I worked in a retail office, really learned a lot about the business. They picked four kids a year to go back to business school. So they would send us up to Columbia, full scholarship, full salary, and it was a wonderful thing. I applied. I assumed that I was not going to get into the program because I set my wedding date during the first term of business school. And shockingly to my fiance and now my wife, I was accepted to Columbia and off I went and did that for two years and then came back to the corporate finance area of Payne Weber. When you had all of those different initial experiences, how did you figure out which one you wanted to apply your trade in. I really enjoyed the people on the trading desk because they were really a bunch of characters. They had these really kind of bold, loud personalities, et cetera. And there was a lot of trading that took place at the time that was much more kind of gut and feel and kind of relationship, et cetera. And they were really interesting folks. At the end of the day, I was just really more interested in this corporate finance. That's something I've always wanted to try and wanted to give it a go. And so I ended up in the corporate finance department and I started working for a guy named Hercules Segalis, which is probably one of the great names of all time. Herc was this big Greek guy. He spoke six languages. At the time I had been out of the country maybe once or twice. He was a former research analyst, number one research analyst in the consumer product space for many years on that before he moved over to investment banking in the early 80s. From Herc, I learned a lot. Number one is I would go to Herc with the, the spreadsheets and say why this one company should buy another company or why this one company should sell a brand. And even though he was the number one research analyst on Wall Street, he didn't really understand the numbers very well. But he was asking me questions about the brand. What did I know about the management team? How are the sales going? All these questions that I had no idea on the answers because I was just into my Lotus 1, 2, 3 spreadsheet. But in working with Herc, he kind of dragged me all over the world being these great consumer product companies. So I would go to Germany to meet Meyersdorf and Cow to meet Japan. And I really fell in love with the consumer product space and the brand building area. Where did you take it from there? So in my travels with Herc, he always said, if you have ever chance to kind of move to the principal side, you should think about doing that. And at the time, there really wasn't much in lower middle market consumer investing out there. Most of the deals were being done by generalist firms. But I had this entrepreneurial streak and wanted to do something different. So in the mid-90s, I moved over to Hong Kong and helped open the Hong Kong office for Payne Weber, where I really focused on the M&A and consumer products and tried to bring U.S. companies over to China and try to put deals together there. And what was the infrastructure like to bring, a, say, a U.S. brand over to China it back in the 90s? A, it was a young man's goal and an ambition and not a lot of thought going into that decision of mine to do that. But there was really, over in China at the time, there was really no great distribution network. And it was all big state-owned enterprises, which also made it difficult to kind of work out relationships. So I was over there for three years and frankly didn't get a lot of traction out there, but learned a lot and also learned that within failure, you can kind of dust yourself up and get out and try it again. So you came back to the States in 97? So I came back in 97, right after the handover. And then I was recruited by Lehman Brothers to go join them as they were expanding their consumer effort. And at the time in the late 90s, everybody wanted to move to a bigger shop. And I thought that I wanted to move to a bigger shop, leaving Payne Weber that was more focused in the middle market. And in my brief stint at Lehman Brothers, though they were terrific people there, I really did not enjoy calling on big CPG to try to go do their Eurobond and really miss working with the entrepreneurial companies that I had been working with at Payne Weber, both in New York as well as in Hong Kong. It was in the late 90s and 99 that I got a call from the Shansby Group, which is now TSG Consumer, to join the two founders as the third partner there. At the time, they were a sub $200 million fund with a very strong track record, really focusing on the consumer product space exclusively. And I thought, well, this is my opportunity. And with that, I resigned from Lehman Brothers, which my colleagues there thought I was crazy leaving this big bulge racket firm to go to this very small private equity to go do that. With my family, we all moved out to San Francisco and I joined them. What was that initial transition like? 
So I think moving from banking to private equity is a big challenge because in banking, you're really kind of focused on solving whatever problem is thrown your way in terms of trying to meet this financing need or trying to put these two companies together. As a principal, you have to decide, is that a problem you really want to solve? And that was a really big adjustment for me. And it was really some lessons I had to learn during that time. I spent five years at TSG and I was cut from a different cloth than the two founders. And one holiday in 2004, I woke up one morning and told my wife that I just needed to resign. I needed to go do something else. She asked, well, well, what are you thinking about doing? And at the time, I really had no idea. So after the holidays, I went in and I spoke to Chuck and the other folks and said, you know, this isn't working for me. We need to find a way to kind of separate. I walked out of that breakfast, not really knowing what to do, but I picked up the phone and I called someone I've met in the past, a fellow by the name of Dave Barham who was running The Firm, which is an entertainment management company who had done a lot of work for some of our portfolio companies, specifically Vibe and Water over time, and said, hey, I'm just leaving TSG. We should get together sometime and chat about finding ways to work together. Dave decided to hop on an airplane that day, and we came up, he flew up to San Francisco where we had lunch at Kokari, and we talked about maybe we should do some type of a partnership together and think about investing in the consumer product space, but in a different way. Over the course of the next several weeks and months, some more folks who were at TSG reached out and wanted to be part of the team. Scott Case, a young superstar, Kara Rell, decided to join the team. Bob Schultz, who was kind of in charge of a lot of the portfolio on the food company, decided to join. And we decided to form VMG Partners as a group. So we had six of us to go do it. We had a combined maybe 15 or 16 years of private equity experience, so an average of two or three. And foolishly, we decided to go out and raise a fund. What did VMG stand for? We were wrestling with what to name the shop. We didn't want to name it after ourselves. We reached out to a friend. We asked him for some names on what we should call our shop. And he sent over 10 names. Some were Summit Partners, Excel Partners, many names that had already been taken that he just didn't know. And at the bottom of the list was one called Velocity Made Good. And it was a term I had never heard before. And what it means is you have to optimize all your variables to maximize your speed from point A to point B. And it might not be a straight line. And it's a term that's used by pilots. It's a term used by sailors, of which I am neither. But Scott Case's uh, father was a commercial pilot. Kara Rell's husband was a marine fighter pilot. We had other folks on the team who were quite familiar with the term, and we decided to use that as a way of really branding ourselves. So if you take a step back and think about this consumer space that you're playing in, what is it about this consumer products that gets you excited and has motivated you throughout this time? What gets me excited is that I think we have this modern consumer today, and I don't think that is a certain age group or certain region group, but it's a large group of us that are all looking for a more fulfilling, a healthier life overall. And I think it's the entrepreneurs that have been building those brands across all different categories that kind of support us as we're going through that journey. When we formed VMG, we had that general tenet of this is where the consumer was moving to, and we thought it could be an attractive place to invest. We also believed that the lower middle market had been a very attractive place for people to invest ever since I've gotten out of college, but many firms decided to use that as a launching pad to create much larger funds. And we thought that we love this. This is our passion. What if we were to invest in this space, hopefully learn from this space and get better at being a value add partner to our portfolio companies, stay in this space and continue to invest and really work with entrepreneurs to help them meet their goals. On a individual company basis, as you take that initial step back, a lot of that earlier stage entrepreneurial investing these days, you just hear about technology with infinite scale, and these are consumer products. How do you go about thinking about the initial kind of risk reward in these situations? Yeah, it's a bit of art and it's a bit of science. What we're really looking for are for brands that have a real passionate consumer. Because we think if a brand has a passionate consumer with a small group, there may be a very good opportunity to expand it to a larger group. So we're always looking for those entrepreneurs that have really built those special brands on that. We also bring in a little bit of science and take looking at the sales through data, et cetera, and making sure that the brand is on the right track and everything what the entrepreneur 
entrepreneurs believing is actually happening in the marketplace. And when we combine that art and that science, we think we make very good group decisions to support entrepreneurs and brands on their journey. What does that initial funnel look like? Are you using data? I, mean, I imagine there's a lot of data. There's a lot of data, but you know what we do is that we want to go out and meet with all the small companies out there that we can. And I think that's part of our approach to building relationships. One of the things when we set up BMG, we thought the industry was really changing in private equity. From being a very much focused on, as I always said, the PE was the sun of the solar system and everything was revolving around that to really, in our case, the consumer and the entrepreneur being the sun of our solar system. And we are just one of the many planets rotating around that. Our goal is to be supportive to the entire ecosystem. And that includes meeting a lot of small companies. One of the things that's changed dramatically in my experience in private equity is the move towards transparency. When I first got into the business in the early 2000s, we would have a brochure that we could then slot in the back, whatever references we wanted, whatever track record we wanted, however we wanted to position ourselves, we could go to a entrepreneur and say, here we are, talk to this person, et cetera. Now, I think in a world of transparency, any entrepreneur can go onto our website, can go onto our LinkedIn accounts, find every transaction that we've invested in. They could reach out to any entrepreneur that we worked with. And by the way, they can work out to other people in our ecosystem that we have not done transactions with. Our goal is that if we can be helpful to people in our ecosystem, they'll define the VMG brand. And I think that has been part of the basis for our success. I imagine there are a lot of these companies, a lot of entrepreneurs doing this. How do you start to winnow that funnel? So we do have a kind of a minimum size parameter we like to see. We like to see 5 to $10 million of sales building out there, strong gross margins. But it really comes from meeting with the entrepreneur. One of the things as we kind of bring new people into our investment team, one of the things we always encourage them to do is just to listen. These entrepreneurs are full of information and full of thought and full of belief. And we need to listen to them because they are the ones who are closest to the consumer in their category, and they're telling us where the consumer is going to. And so if we get that connection with an entrepreneur, we see the opportunity that they're building, and then we also find an entrepreneur who's looking for our help in building out their business. And they're aware of their strengths, of their weaknesses, and look to VMG as being kind of that partner to go through that journey with. Where do the entrepreneurs you back tend to come out of? That's really changed a lot over the past 20 years. 20 years ago, I always said it was a bunch of misfit folks who didn't want to work at big companies. And frankly, I kind of fit into that demographic as well. I think now our entrepreneurs are much more diverse. Over the past year, half of our transactions have been with women founders and women leaders of businesses there. We are finding excellent companies from all different parts of the country. They tend to form in certain areas. Boulder, Colorado is a great place. Austin's a great place. San Diego is a great place. They happen to be wonderful cities to go visit for board meetings, but it's a real exciting time for us. And what is it that you're looking for in that entrepreneur? So we're looking for a little bit of scrappiness. We're looking for someone who has some good insights into their consumer and why they feel that their brand is uniquely suited for that need. And that may not be a need or a niche that is fully outlined in the data. As we say, big CPG is always looking backwards. They're looking at categories and how they have performed. These entrepreneurs are really looking forward. And I think they're discovering these new niches in these very large categories categories that can be large over time and are looking for support from a firm like VMG to help them grow. What's an example of something that fits that description in the sense that you saw something, there was nothing necessarily in the data that would have said, hey, this is going to be a big category or it's a massively growing category, but there was something about the entrepreneur and the opportunity. Yeah. I mean, a great example would be Daniel Levetsky from Kind. Daniel, I think, was a serial entrepreneur and identified this product, which was this fruit and nut bar product that was far healthier than many of the other kind of brands and bars that were out there at the time. I think he recognized that the consumer was moving towards a diet that wanted more nuts and more fruit and saw that bar as a real transformational way of providing that to them and a real convenient way to provide to that. He built a very unique brand around that with that transparency on the packaging. And he was an incredibly scrappy founder. And he's really built one of the great food companies in the United States over the past 10 to 15 years. So at the time, say 10 or 15 years ago, 
that category, like you, you couldn't see it in the numbers? No, I mean, it was a sub $20 million brand. It was a sub $20 million category. And I don't think any of us knew how large that category could be. But once again, in listening to Daniel, he had a strong understanding and strong belief of where that consumer was going and believed that his kind bar could really meet a long-term need of the modern consumer. And did you see in it really him? Or is there a way you could go back and verify like, oh, that thesis is going to hold? So it was really supporting Daniel as well as supporting, I think, the brand that he built. It was clear that even though the brand was relatively small, he really had a very strong and passionate consumer base. And so we thought that combination of Scrappy, very smart founder, combined with the passionate consumer base, really had the opportunity to grow to something special. So I've been a big consumer of Kind Bars, and particularly the chocolate yeah, and the sea salt. Right. But I do wonder at times, like, how healthy is this? Oh, yeah, and so is. how does that fit into the trends that you're talking about? So when we look at this kind of modern consumer and where they're going, they're not making a huge leap from highly processed food to raw vegetable. They're on a journey. And I think the entrepreneurs are meeting the needs of that consumer while they're on that journey. A great example could be in the beverage space. When I grew up, we drank a lot of Coca-Colas, high in calorie, high in sugar. It never crossed our mind that it was an unhealthy drink. We probably knew it wasn't the healthiest drink. We had the opportunity to invest with the folks at Vitamin Water when I was at my former shop. You know, I think Mike Rapoli and Darius Bykoff saw the opportunity to create a healthier beverage than a Coca-Cola, but it was still 50 calories, still had some sugar in the product. But at the time, I think everybody thought it was very healthy. Right before that, Snapple had been out. And people, I think, in New York City especially thought Snapple was super uh, healthier than a soda. In reality, it was probably modestly healthier than a soda. So you had soda, Snapple, vitamin water. And then if you look at what's happening now in the marketplace, you had buy maybe five years ago, which would be a lower calorie drink. We have a wonderful portfolio company, Spindrift, which I think meets the needs on that sparkling water with a little bit of fruit to give it some flavor. And I think that consumer is working on that journey towards a healthier beverage. As you go out and build a portfolio of these companies, I'd imagine there are only so many beverage companies you want to work with at a time, maybe so many fruit and nut, and then there's other categories. How do you build a portfolio without having competition within the portfolio companies? One is we're really transparent and we bring the entrepreneurs together so they can kind of work together. And I think as they understand the different niches that they're following, I think they understand that they could learn from the other entrepreneurs that are part of the portfolio and that we at VMG, to be the best partner we can, can learn from other companies that could be in their category or, or an ancillary type of category. In general, though, I think what we try to do is to go after the best opportunity and not get worried about the portfolio construction from a diversity of different categories. We're very much interested in finding the right brand with the right entrepreneur. Where are you seeing those big opportunities today? So across the portfolio, I think we've done really well in the low sugar space. So we had a business quest that we were an investor in that recently sold to Simply Good Foods. It's a large public company. We have a very interesting portfolio company called Lily's, which is a low sugar chocolate business that's based out of Boulder that we're very excited about. So that low sugar trend seems to be one that seems to be very prevalent in that. The other is in the beauty space that we've seen a lot of brands that the consumers are caring much more about the ingredients in the brands and what they're putting onto their skin. And so we just sold Drunk Elephant to Shiseido last year that kind of fit on that trend. And then some bum we just sold to S.E. Johnson. I think both of those brands, I think, met that trend. What is the pitch that you give the entrepreneur in a competitive situation? What we talk to them is one is we say, go call any of the entrepreneurs that we've worked with in the past and ask if we're a partner. What we try to stress to them that this is a journey. We don't have a specific playbook. We don't have any special answers. But what we're willing to do is to roll the sleeves and understand what makes your brand special and what are those challenges ahead and to help identify the resources to support you in doing that to make sure that your vision is something that we could execute on. So as we kind of lay that out and we spend time with them, we have real questions to them about their team. Where are the gaps in their team? What's their distribution strategy? What's their manufacturing strategy? What's their go-to-market? What's their branding? And through that period of getting to know them, we hope that they get comfortable with us as being that partner, not a partner that knows the answer, but a partner that's willing to kind of discover the answers 
And uh, does together. that work? I mean, if you're competing against people, they say, no, 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 we know exactly what you need to do in this, this, and this. Well, we think it's been working for us. It's also the way we work. So it's the honest way. We always encourage these entrepreneurs to go talk to other folks. And if somebody they think is a better partner for them, we really encourage them to go do it. But we hope that we can be a good partner to a real diversity of entrepreneurs. And then once you've struck a deal, let's say you're the lead in a situation, what's the set of levers that you try to work with them on to improve the business? So I think the first thing we try to identify is the team that's in place and what they need. Some entrepreneurs are very strong CEOs and want to really run that through. Others go, hey, this business has hit a size where it's kind of outgrowing my skill set and what I care about. So that's really the first conversation with the, the entrepreneur. We have a very strong talent team at VMG, and they work with any specific deal team to help assess that management team and see where those gaps are. So the first thing we try to do is really put that management team in place. And then we look at each phase of the business, the branding, the go-to-market strategy, the manufacturing, et cetera, and see where the strengths or weaknesses are and see where our skill set in terms of our knowledge from previous transactions, as well as the resources that we have both internally and externally could be helpful to that company to execute on that. I think the other thing that we do really well with those entrepreneurs is really sit down and try to set the priorities on it. One thing about entrepreneurs is they have a ton of energy and they want to go a million miles and a million different ways. And I think what we can do is help them think about what is the best use of their time and the best use of their resources to build what they want to build. As the ecosystem for these companies develops, how much do you get caught up in the competition from private equity? Clearly, there's been more dollars that's coming in that's been driving values slightly higher. We also have to move with a speed to conviction faster than I think we had to maybe five to 15 years ago. So how do you assess trends? So we do it kind of two ways. One is I think we're proactive in looking at general research data, but we don't like to be too top down in the way we approach things. We really wanna to listen to the entrepreneurs and kind of tell us on why the consumer is moving that way. One thing we've always been conscious of is making sure that we're in, not investing in bad brands in great categories. So we don't wanna talk ourselves into a category. We wanna talk ourselves into a great entrepreneur and a great brand. And is there a methodology to assess the brand? So there are different tools that people use. One's a net promoter score that, that you kind of do an interview. You ask people to take a survey, and if they're high on the brand, they can have a high NPS. I think what we try to do is talk to everybody we can in our ecosystem about a brand and about an opportunity and about an entrepreneur. So that would include relationships that we have with retailers, relationships that we have with manufacturers, relationships that we have with bankers, relationships we have with strategics, relationships that we have with managers. And from that whole ecosystem, I think we're able to develop an insight into the brand and into the entrepreneur. So why don't you walk through a couple of situations, both success and maybe dicey. So on the icy side, I should say, at times when we have, I think, failed, in accomplishing what we want to accomplish, I think we've had too much hubris in what we can do to a brand. So I think when you look at a brand, you see what it is. And I think we have visions of what a brand can be. An entrepreneur has visions of what a brand can be. And when we have failed to execute, I think it's because we've tried to do too much, to change it too much, to try to make it something that it is not. So I think that has been a challenge What's for What's a us. good example of that? A good example of that would be a brand like Lantana. We saw it was an alternative hummus business. We needed to rebrand it, come up with a new name, come up with a new packaging, come up with a new supply chain. And it had just too much complexity for us in doing to try to make all those things work right. And it turned out to be a transaction that was not a good one. Is there something innate about hummus that leaded you to think that there was an alternative that would be better? So I think the idea is that people were eating hummus and using alternative beans would be another healthy way of having another healthy dip. People were going to the refrigerated section of the store. It was an interesting product for that. When you look at kind of wins that we've had along those lines, take one in the same part of the store in the refrigerated section, and it's a company called Perfect Snacks. And it's a wonderful business that was started by a brother and sister team in their early 20s. And it is a refrigerated bar. 
And they had built this business up into sub $20 million and were looking for a partner to provide capital in there and growth. And what we were able to help them go do is really build out the management team between the brother and sister. So we helped them recruit a new head of ops. We helped them recruit a new CFO. We helped them recruit a new head of sales and really think about the strategy of go to market to expand from being a predominantly Costco business to a much more diversified business and also be able to launch new products. We recently sold that last year to Mondelez. That was a big win for the family. So that's another food that I've consumed some. What is it about the perfect brand that allowed it to scale when so many others don't? So I think it was they saw a niche that others didn't see, which was to have a fresh product in the refrigerated section. Now, it made for a huge challenge for the team because there wasn't a bar section of the refrigerator in the grocery store. So I think they saw an opportunity and then also saw the risk of being able to execute, but put together kind of a strategy to be able to do that. So as you've talked about a bunch of these companies and particularly the sales You mentioned Mondelez, you mentioned Pepsi. I mean, these are strategic companies. They're not other private equity sponsors. Is that pervasive across your portfolio company? So our goal is to really work with the entrepreneurs to sell to a big strategic. So we've exited 20 plus brands over the past 10 years and all but one have been to the strategic buyers. I think the big strategic CPGs are looking for us and others for their growth in their portfolio. They're not very good at nurturing smaller entrepreneurial brands and really see the acquisition of these brands as a real opportunity for them to generate top line growth. So what's happened to these brands once they're inside a big CPG? It's interesting. Things are kind of changing. In general, I think big CPG is doing much better with the brands today, in part because I think they changed the way that they've been working with those brands. So 15 years ago, when they would buy a brand, they would basically strip out it from the company and pop it into their system and the brand would probably go and die. What I think they're realizing these days is that these brands are special, these entrepreneurs are special, and these management teams are special. And so they're leaving these brands and these teams together. So if you look at some of our recent sales, whether it be Justin's to Hormel Foods, Perfect Bar to Mondelez, Quest is Simply Good, you're seeing those companies deciding to leave those brands in place and leave those management teams in place in hopes that they can maintain that special relationship with the consumer and the retailer that they have. What is it about those management teams that's so different from the management teams of brands inside the CPG? They are entrepreneurs and they're willing to kind of take that chance. And I think one of the things that the leaders of these big CPGs now are seeing is they want that DNA in their organization. Organization. They realize that they want those types of people to work with it. And what they're trying to do is to figure out what's the right comp model, what's the right incentive model to keep those people working within a small part of a big CPG company. One of the obvious consumer trends you haven't talked about is cannabis. And I'm wondering, have you done anything in that space? So we've looked at that space. We've looked at the CBD space. My general view of it is that CBD is going to be an ingredient. And I think a lot of brands will have it over time. And if it's effective, you're going to see those traditional brands incorporated. I think CBD in terms of THC is a real unique product and one that's going to take away from the alcohol and spirits place. I think we're seeing that in places like California and Colorado. But you haven't participated. We in haven't it. participated in that. And why is that? I think right now it's just too much of the Wild West. I think valuations are out of line. So I think we'll wait to see that industry settle a little bit more before we'll make a decision whether we'll participate or not. On the spectrum of Coca-Cola to water, as drinks as an example, where are we on this journey towards healthier living? So I still think we're in the midpoint at best. One is I think we're seeing more people get onto that journey than ever before. And I think that's what really scares CPG, that the people who got on that journey 15 or 20 years ago was one small set. And now I think we're seeing a much larger group of people getting on that journey. How do you guys work as a team? We have an investment team of about 12 folks. We have five partners, including myself. We've been working together. Kara and I have worked together for 20 years. Robin and Wayne for about 11, 12 years together. Dave, 15 years. So we work very closely together. We make decisions as a group on that. We really all all want to own the decision. And if it's success, we all bask in the glory of it. And if it's a problem, we all work on trying to solve that problem together that there's no finger pointing. We say we have a what do you think culture. We're constantly saying, well, what do you think about this deal? What do you think about it? What do you think about this part of the deal? Are you comfortable with this entrepreneur? And we're constantly asking ourselves that question. 
I think we've made good decisions as a team because we talk about the deals many times. I'm always amazed by firms that can have like an investment committee meeting and people are seeing it for the first or second time and they are saying yes or no. It's just not in our DNA and how we think. How does that evolution with a single company work across your team? Yeah, so usually somebody meets that company really very early. They're oftentimes sub $5 million and they'll come back to our group on our Monday meeting and they'll talk about companies they met this week and they'll say, really interesting entrepreneur, really what they're trying to do. We really need to keep an eye on that. That entrepreneur may be at a trade show where other partners might be at. And so other partners might stop by their booth and spend 15 or 20 minutes just to get to know that person. What we try to do with that entrepreneur too is just find out what their problems are, what their issues are, and see if we could be helpful in some way. Sometimes they're looking for a new marketing person or a new salesperson, and our talent team could be helpful to them. Our team puts together innovation summits with key retailers in our space, and we might invite those brands to the retailer summit. They're not our portfolio companies, but we're going to be helpful to them. And what we hope over time is that we get to see them, see how they think about an opportunity, and they get to see us and see how we work with an opportunity. And then as they get to a size where they're going to need capital to build their business, we hope they'll consider VMG. So for the companies that are in your portfolio today, how long do you think someone on your team had known them before you made an investment? Well, I tell you, for sometimes it's been four or five years that we've known the company before they've come into the portfolio. And what's the shortest? Probably a year is probably the shortest. I can't think of a deal we've done where all of a sudden somebody walks in the door and we say, okay, great, we'll do it. Yeah. And so on the other side of your business, how is the capital from your LPs built up from when you were first starting at a TPS to today? We start off with a $325 million fund, which at the time was the largest first time ever consumer product fund. We raised that fund with no track record in our book. It took us almost two years, start to finish, to kind of go do it, which was a crazy long winding road journey. But those LPs that came in on fund one have been our partners all the way through. And we've been so fortunate to have a group that we could kind of talk to, bounce ideas off of, because our team, when we formed VMG, we had really very little experience in private equity and running a private equity firm. And we really needed some of the input from some of our LPs to really be helpful and think through some of the key issues. What were some of those key issues? How do you grow the team over time? How do you compensate the team? How do we communicate and be transparent? One of the funny stories about that is at my former firm, they didn't have annual meetings. And so our LPs wanted to have an annual meeting. And I had personally had never been to an annual meeting before. I didn't know what it would be. And so Kara Rell and I were out meeting with some LPs and we asked one or two of them, could we go sit in the conference room and could you bring us some books, not anything in the consumer space of other LP meeting that you've been to that you thought was thoughtful and the way it outlined. And we literally sat there and looked at a couple of the different books and laid out an outline for our very first LP meeting. And so in that initial two-year journey to getting capital, what was that winding road like? So it was interesting. We used Park Hill Capital. We were very lucky to have them as our placement agent. Dan Prendergast, who passed away this past year, became a very close friend. And they really stuck with us through thick and thin. But it was kind of unique because we would go out and talk to folks and do a week of marketing. And then we'd have a week off our team. And we'd had no capital. We had really nothing to do. But what it really allowed us to do during that time was to think about, well, how do we want to interact with each other? What kind of processes do we want to put in place? How do we want to treat the banking community? How do we want to treat the legal community? So we had so many of those conversations as a team that I really think put the formation of VMG together, where if we left our former shop and then raced out and got the capital very quickly and raced to go deploy it, I'm not so sure we would have been as thoughtful about it. And so what is that ethos of VMG? So I think it's very much of a team approach, number one, and it's a sense of trying to make the pie bigger. As we kind of mentioned earlier, the transparency was coming to the marketplace right about that time. And our general thought is that we could be helpful to everyone, that we could really differentiate ourselves. But it really required us to think about how are we willing to sacrifice a little bit for ourselves as individuals, as a firm, to really create a larger pie for not only ourselves, but our LPs, but the broader consumer community. How much is the broader environment for private equity infiltrated what you're seeing in companies? 
Yeah, it was interesting. When I first got into the private equity business 20 years ago, we had to explain what private equity was, what things were priced at. And I go meet with an entrepreneur today and they've been building a business for the past year and they can walk through 10 consumer PE firms. They can walk through the multiples that companies traded at. There's just so much more information out there what's going on. And I think the entrepreneurs are in a better position to judge who's going to be the right partner for them. How have you thought about the globalization of some of these brands? It's something we've given a lot of thought to. Our very first sale was with Nestle with a company called Wagon Train. And they notified us and told us that that was an IP issue in China with the Wagon Train name. And we had no idea about that. But it really opened our eyes that entrepreneurs from around the world were looking at U.S. brands and were copying those brands and taking them over to the home market. Sometimes they were doing a direct copy, which is counterfeit. But other times they would just make it slightly different. And so it really has made us think about, are there certain brands that really do have international opportunities that we should work with and support them as they meet their growth needs. How have you gone about doing that? So one way we've done it is I went back to my roots and my experience in Asia, and we formed a partnership with Hill House Capital, where we have invested in certain brands that they've identified over in China, and they've invested with certain of our portfolio companies here in the U.S. that we could bring over to China. So how does that work? Are they helping with distribution in China? They are really a very much of a thought leader. And so they've been very helpful in making introductions to our brands over there and trying to find the right team to help those brands expand. And what's evolved from back in 97 when you were there trying to get brands into SOEs to today? It's remarkable. I think anybody who's traveled over there kind of knows that. But when I was over there, originally I was trying to take these brands over there, and there's really no distribution for the brands there. Now it's kind of leapfrogged the United States in terms of their distribution with what they're doing online. Lay and the team from Hill House were real leaders in investing in that space and real confidence to the leaders of that space in helping build out those brands. And as I said, they've really built the tubes of distribution in China. Now those tubes need brands. And I think the opportunity that Lay and I saw in working together was that we could bring those brands from the United States into those tubes. The other thing that's happened over in China that's made it interesting for us to think about investing over there is the entrepreneurial environment. We're invested in two brands. One's a baby food company called Little Freddy. One is a beauty company called Perfect Diary. Both of them are outstanding brands, tremendous growth prospects. And I think they're some of the best entrepreneurs that are in our portfolio. Have you seen more success taking a brand that starts here and distributing it in China or the other way around, a Chinese brand distributed in the U.S.? So much more of the U.S. brand going over there. I think there is a sense over there of the U.S. quality of the brands and trying to have that kind of Western experience in certain categories. And so in that partnership you have with Hill House, are you just both investing alongside each other? So what we try to do is that if it's a Chinese company, we kind of look to Hill House to kind of make many of the key decisions from an operational standpoint and when things are going in and out. I think we can be helpful to them as they're looking at the global environment and certain resources that we have in the U.S. going over there. And same over here in the United States, when they're an investor with us and some of our brands here that we're taking over to China, will help make some of the key decisions about the operational needs of the business here in the U.S. But as it moves over into China, we'll certainly look for them and their expertise in helping us think through that strategy. How do you think about the sort of macroeconomic risks and tariffs and then on the micro side of what, Hong Kong protests, disease, all this kind of yeah, stuff? Yeah, no, I mean, it's something we give a lot of thought to and we kind of dig into it. Our general thought is that it has to have a higher bar if we're investing outside the United States, no doubt about it. And so I think we have to believe that we can outrun any of those regulatory constraints that get put in place. As you now look out over the next few years, where are you most excited about putting capital to work in your space? So as this journey continues, I think we see it not only in the food and beverage and beauty area, but also I think more in the experiential area. I think consumers are changing their spending patterns and we're seeing that with that modern consumer. And I think we're gonna look to participate in that, whether that be areas of travel, whether that be areas of fitness. Have you plowed into that yet? We started to do some work in that area, and I think we're real excited by some of the entrepreneurs that we're seeing. I think they're looking for us because of our experience in building these types of brands to be complement some of the skill set that they have. Where do you see the most fierce competition? So the fierce competition, I think, is really coming from all areas. I think we're seeing more firms that are dedicated to the lower middle market consumer space than ever before. 
We're seeing strategic set up their own investment arms to try to participate. I think we have international buyers coming into the market. So there is a plethora of capital. I think it's incumbent on us to make sure that we're positioning VMG with the entrepreneurs, that we could be their best partner in trying to accomplish what they want to accomplish, which is not only just kind of growing the brand and exiting, but really see that brand become something special that is part of their legacy. What's your favorite story of one of your investments? Oh, gosh, there's so many. I guess the favorite story would have to be going back to the Perfect Bar. And I just touched on it briefly, but it was a brother and sister team. Bill and Lee Keith set up this brand after their father passed away. And they were two of 13 children that were younger than they were. And they got the whole family involved in building this business. They took the mantle of responsibility for the family from a financial standpoint and really built a small business that they were very proud about. We were able to get involved with the business, help them grow that. And when we exited that business to Mondelez, it was such a win for that entire family who's been on this 12-year journey that we felt very lucky to participate with them. That's extraordinary. All right, Mike, let's turn to a couple of fun closing questions. What's your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? Over the years, I've dragged my poor wife to biking in Europe and we've biked up all the Alps and we decided to do something new. And so we've gotten into long distance open water swimming. Last year, we were down in the Greek islands where we would swim anywhere from six to seven K a day for a week and really loved that. Uh, That's great. What's your biggest pet peeve? People on their phones. I just find that, you know, when people are out to dinner, that you miss this opportunity to to engage in conversation and people get distracted. So whether it be professionally or personally, just when people are on their phone when we're out to dinner just drives me crazy. Yeah. How about your biggest investment pet peeve? One is proprietary sourcing. I sit on a few different investment committees over the years for different institutions, and we would interview private equity shops, and somebody would come in and talk about their proprietary sourcing network, and I would just kind of roll my eyes. I think in today's world, there's really no such thing as proprietary sourcing. What else have you learned from sitting on those investment committees? I've learned the importance of really understanding the team dynamics. And I might have learned that more from being part of a team. And I think it's really hard for the LPs to dive in and and get a sense of, is this a team that's really going to stick together through thick and thin? Do they really value each other? And when I've been on the other side of the table trying to assess that, I found that to be a difficult challenge. How do you use social media professionally? I don't really use it much at all. I have other partners in my shop who I think use it very effectively. I respect people who use social media to help the overall ecosystem. And so when they're recognizing other people or they're providing information that's of value to it, frankly, I've seen in the VC world, too many people use it for self-promotion. And I just kind of find that to be unnecessary. It surprises me that that wouldn't be an integral part of your research process and understanding trends of brands. Well, to be fair, we do use that. I was thinking more of my own personal social media on that. We do use that and we do look at Instagram and we do look at how brands are using social media, who's following it, what's the growth rate of that. That's part of the science of making the decision. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? Well, I guess there's two things. One is my parents were always involved in community service. And I think in today's world, a lot of people talk about how much they contribute to something, the dollar checks that they write and you walk, you know, you go to these different events and they list people based on the dollars they contribute. And my parents didn't have the resources to be major contributors or anything, but they spent a lot of time contributing to organizations in the community. They set a very high bar for all of us to try to attest to. So we try to do that. Today, the day we're recording this, it happens to be my mother's birthday and she passed away about four months ago. So This morning, I've been thinking a lot about mom and what I learned from her. And she graduated from community college in Southern Missouri and had me when she was 21 and went back to work in her late 30s in the PR and eventually rose up to be head of community relations and partnerships for the PBS station here in New York City. And she always valued interesting people and finding partnerships to put together. And I think a little bit what we do at VMG is a little bit what my mom was doing at PBS. And so hopefully she's kind of proud of what we're doing. Great. All right. Last one. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? So one thing about being part of the food industry for so long is that I've seen every diet possible come in and every product that supports every diet over time. But I think the one thing that I know now that I wish I would have known 20 years ago was less added sugar in my diet. And I think if consumers just consume less sugar, 
no matter what protein, whether you're fasting, not fasting, keto, not keto, I think you'll have a healthier lifestyle. Great. Mike, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you'd like what you heard, please tell a friend and maybe even write a review on iTunes. You'll help others discover the show, and I thank you for it. Have a good one, and see you next time. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. All opinions expressed by guests on this show are solely their own opinion and do not necessarily reflect those of their firm. A manager's appearance on the show does not constitute an endorsement or investment recommendation by TED or Capital Allocators.